Hello everybody, my name is Ray. Welcome to the Evangelical Dark Web. Today, we're going to be responding to Alistair Begg's counteroffensive. He gave a sermon in which he defended his sinful counsel of an elderly woman to attend a gay wedding and bear gifts in the process of doing so. So this was a sin, a reproach on Alistair Begg's ministry. He is attacking those who called him out on this. And we're going to respond, obviously, because we broke the story in the first place and made it go viral here at Evangelical Dark Web. And I, I got to say, like, I'm, I'm done with Alistair Bay. He is not someone that we can recommend or even commend as a teacher. And this is not the first compromise in his ministry. If you do look at his record, he's pretty soft on the issue of female pastors in the past. And... Uh, we're also going to point out some other instances of cowardice from Alistair Begg as well. But in this sermon that he gave this past Sunday, he attacks the people that called him out over his sinful counsel. So we're going to respond to him. And I got to say, he might still be saved, but he is not a serious pastor in this day and age. He does not know what time it is. And I think we should just avoid him. So he's not someone that we recommend, and I would recommend against him because he's not a serious person. He can't exegete the world. He can't do 2 plus 2 equals 4 with Christian ethics. And it's sad to behold. His position on gay weddings is worse and more liberal than Russell Moore's position. That's how bad his position is. Just to put some context on it. I brought that up in the first video. but now. It's time to respond to his sermon in which he doubled down on his effeminate counsel to a grandmother. So we're going to get into that. But first, I want to let you know, Evangelical Dark Web is a Christian news gathering and commentary ministry. You can support us over at our Patreon like system at evangelicaldarkweb.org slash join. That's where you can go. But we also have the website evangelicaldarkweb.org where you can get Christian news each and every day. So you can also sign up for the free newsletter there. But the least you can do is like this video, subscribe to the channel, to the podcast, if you are new. So without further ado, let's dive into this terrible sermon by Alistair Begg. Oh, I am called to be like the Samaritan, who is the classic illustration of loving and lending and doing good without a calculator and without the expectation of a payback. Now that is then the context when a grandmother phones me up in tears and gravely concerned for the circumstances in relationship to one of our grandchildren. I'm not quoting the book to her. I'm only responding to her. She wrote a long letter. It sat on my desk for a long time. This happens to us all as pastors all the time. And on that occasion, when I listened to her talk, my great concern was for her and for her relationship with her granddaughter. I wasn't thinking about the nature of the circumstances in that moment of time. All I was thinking about was how can I help this grandmother not to lose her granddaughter, who has already publicly turned her back on God and her back on God's design and in every other way. And in the course of that conversation, I said, you know, one of the ways in which to catch your granddaughter off guard is actually do the opposite of what she expects you to do. What does she expect you to do? Avoid her. Stay away from her. Don't get contaminated by the situation. I said, well, isn't that interesting? So what would happen if you actually went? Well, that gave great pause. And I said, but you should talk to your husband. You've got to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And those were all the caveats that went around the conversation. But then I said, well, I think you should go. And why don't you give her a gift? Well, how would I ever know that that would set the cat among the pigeons? Because after all, it was a personal conversation between myself and somebody that I've never met in my entire life. And it was born out of the kind of conviction that I was personally rec reckoning with myself. I don't like this. I'm opposed to this. I do not endorse this. I have no interest in this. But this is my granddaughter. Now, it's that context then that gave rise to that. Now, I got to come back to the text because that was a deviation. So, let's respond with some Bible verses quickly on this subject. I got a few written down. So, a lot of people, and I'm going to call Joel Berry while we're at it. He's uh, one of the dudes over at the Babylon B, and you know, he's kind of a cold poster at times, but nonetheless, I got some notes here on some Bible verses that are applicable to the situation. So he's trying to make this out to be a Christian liberty situation, like Romans 
14 and he's responding about you know reddit tier responses about eating meat sacrifice to idols but paul talks about this in first corinthians 10 verses 28 through 30 but if anyone says to you this meat uh this is meat sacrificed to idols do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake i mean not to not your own conscience but the other man's for why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? So this is Paul uh, counseling people to not eat meat knowingly. You know, that's presented to them with the, this was sacrificed to idols. So, and this is about the whole eating meat thing, right? Which was a controversy in the early church. So the idea is that if someone's trying to bait you or trap you into eating meat that's sacrificed to idols to bring reproach to your public witness, you should not do that. You should not fall into the trap. So if we want to pretend that gay weddings are a Christian liberty issue, I would point to this liberty issue in which do not bring reproach upon yourself. Do not bring censure from other Christians upon yourself by doing something that appears plainly evil and compromised. That is my response to the idiotic uh, premise that people like Joel Berry are trying to introduce that this is a Christian liberty issue. It is not a Christian liberty issue. This is a sin issue. Romans 1 32 says, and although they know that the ordinance, the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. This is what going to a gay wedding is. It is giving approval tacitly at a minimum. You're tacitly giving approval. You're tacitly participating in the ceremony. First Thess Thessalonians 5.22 says, abstain from every form of evil. The King James Version, because I'm reading the Nazib 95, because I'm a Nazib 95 supremacist, uh, but the King James Version talks about the appearance of evil. Avoid the appearance of evil. And that's kind of a good way to understand that text. Going to a gay wedding is not abstaining from every form of evil. You are participating in a wedding. A wedding is a participatory event. You are those who attend a wedding bear witness to the union at a wedding. If you are attending a gay wedding, you are bearing witness to an abominable union. And that is something that a Christian should not bear witness to. So th that is a sin. This is a sin issue. This is an obedience issue. That's what Alistair Begg refuses to understand. I have a few more Bible verses, but I think we'll, uh, you know, do that at the next break. Uh, we're going to skip ahead to the second clip that I want to share. And a lot of this was kind of already shared on social media by Protestia. But, you know, I'm just kind of doing it on my own here. Often complain loudly of sins they would be quite interested in committing themselves. Be very, very careful when you hear your pastor or your teacher, whoever it is, lambasting a certain area of life, especially in the realm of morality. Time and time again, you will discover that that loud protestation actually, sadly, tragically, proved to be a very thin smokescreen for what was actually going on in the hearts of these people. So I got to pause right here um, because this is a gaslight. I, I think he's completely trying to flip the tables on what really is the more common occurrence that the person who's weak on a certain area of sin is actually the person who's committing that sin. Uh, we like to talk about the judges who give light sentences to pedophiles, probably being shady themselves. If you know what I'm saying, you know, the pastor that's weak on sexual morality is, you know, doing a little hanky panky, you know, Carl Lentz much, or Brian Houston, perhaps. So a lot of these types of pastors, pastors who are weak on this issue, are weak on this issue either because they're sinful in this sort of way, 
or they someone close to them is sinful in this sort of way. That is the much more common paradigm. But what Alistair Begg is talking about is the person who's preaching to themselves. They're struggling with an area of sin. I'm just going to choose pornography as an example. They're preaching against pornography because they're struggling with that sin because they know that they need to hear it too. Now, should someone who's struggling with that sin be in the pastorate? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. But I think that is much more virtuous than the far more common scenario in which someone who struggles with a sin or is close to someone struggling with a certain sin and therefore they are soft on that issue. That is far more common and that is possibly what Alistair Begg is doing here. You know, it's not just grandmothers, you know, that he doesn't know and has never met. Uh, we're going to skip ahead to our third clip out of five. In that conversation with that grandmother, I was concerned about the well-being of their relationship more than anything else, hence my counsel. Don't misunderstand that in any way at all. If I was in the receiving end of another question about another situation from another person in another time, I may answer absolutely differently. But in that case, I answered in that way, and I would not answer in any other way, no matter what anybody says on the internet as of the last 10 days. If that were the case, I would never, if that were the case, I would never, I should never have said it in the first place. If people want to, me to recant and to repent, to repent, I, I, I repent daily because I say a lot of things that I shouldn't say. I mean, check with Sue, but the fact of the matter is I'm not ready to repent over this. I don't have to. Now, let me say something that would be a little explosive. <laughs> I've lived here for 40 years, and those who know me best know that when we talk theology, when we talk stuff, I, I've always said I am a little bit out of sync with the American evangelical world for this reason, that I am the product of British evangelicalism, represented by John Stott, Martin Lloyd-Jones, Eric Alexander, Sinclair Ferguson, Derek Prime. I am a product of that. I have never been a product of American fundamentalism. I come from a world in which it is possible for people to actually grasp the fact that there are nuances in things. Those of you who are lawyers understand this. Everything is not so categorically clear that if you put one foot out of this box, you gotta be removed from the box forever. And so, so that's probably the, the part that gets me the most because he's attacking his own audience, American evangelicals. He's attacking his own audience. You guys don't understand nuance, which, you know, if you go back a little less than 10 years ago, nuance was like the big word that, you know, one of the bigger liberal buzzwords was nuance. But I, I, I digress in that statement. So this idea that he's attacking, you know, ev American evangelicals who, by the way, are far superior, you know, if you look at the scoreboard, far superior to British evangelicals, just look at the state of the church in the UK. It's pretty abysmal. Now, American evangelicals, to quote the famous Stephen Wolf, white evangelicals are the lone bulwark against moral insanity in America. So those are the 11 words. For those of you keeping a track of that online joke, the 11 words of Stephen Wolf, which I paraphrased or reworded slightly. So that's the scoreboard. American evangelicalism has a better foundation than British evangelicalism. I don't think it's particularly close going back a hundred years and or so. So with that said, he's attacking American evangelicalism. He's trying to distance himself from those dreaded fundies. But I like to think we put the fun and fundamentalism here on Evangelical Dark Web. And he is doing what so many liberal pastors do. They attack the fundamentalists and say, I'm not like one of them. I'm not like you guys. I'm not a fundy. And you see that so many times. You know, J.D. Greer was big on doing that. I, I, there's a lot of names that we could na list off that did a lot of this. But Alistair Begg is doing the same thing here. This is such a tired attack on the church. Heard it a lot. We'll continue to hear it in the future. You know, the people that try to do the third wayism, and Alistair Begg is quite familiar with the third wayism because he was associated with the Gospel Coalition. Hmm? So, 
I want to read a couple more Bible verses that are relevant to this situation. Then I got some more stuff to just pile on here. Luke 12, um, 51 through 53. Do you suppose, this is Jesus talking, do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you, no, but rather division. For from now on, five members in one household will be divided three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Luke 9. 23 and he was saying to them all if anyone wishes to come after me he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me this is about suffering the idea of being willing to suffer even you know at the cost of your own family of you know, your natural blood relations and stuff the idea of not going to a gay wedding breaking off the relationship, if that's the cost of following Jesus, then that is a cost you, that is what you do. You take up your cross and you follow Christ. That's what this is about. That is what not attending your grandson or granddaughter's gay wedding is about. You're denying yourself, taking up your cross Any blowback that comes from that, broken relationships that come from that, a divide in the family that comes from that, that is your cross to bear. Jesus bore the cross for your sin, and you can't abstain from a family member's gay wedding? You can't abstain from that after all that Jesus has done for you? We must be willing to suffer for Christ, even if that means broken relationships with family members. Instead, let's talk about Alistair Begg for a second. This is not a dude that's willing to suffer an ounce for Christ. So let's rewind the clocks here. In 2020, so almost four years ago, this dude locked down his church. Why did he do that? Because the governor, Governor DeWine, the guy who also, you know, vetoed legislation protecting, you know, kids from mutilation, the guy who did that, Governor DeWine asked them to. They locked down because of the state. They weren't willing to suffer an ounce in 2020 to follow Christ, to be obedient to Christ. And even still, you know, they imposed mask mandates. On children, too, since that makes it so much worse. So they were mask or they were COVID Nazis at Alistair Begg's uh, Parkside Church. He was a COVID Nazi. Why? Maybe it's because he was a true believer in this. He was a branch Covidian. Or maybe because he was not willing to suffer an ounce of. To follow and obey Christ. Now has Alistair Begg ever repented. Of the stance. He took in 2020. Not to my knowledge. Very few pastors have. He was a coward then. And cowardice is sin by the way. And likewise. His advice now is cowardly. Once. Phariseeism. Is alive and well. In all of our hearts, we have to guard against it. The motivation for purity and holiness of life and circumspection and so on is absolutely unquestionable. The real challenge comes when we are confronted by issues that don't just fit our clean little categories. What distinguished Jesus from the Pharisees, quotes Dodd, was in a word, grace. The divine initiative which first seeks and then saves the lost sinner. He says of the older brother, he represents those to whom religion is a matter of merit and its just reward, and to whom the concept of grace is unjust, even immoral. He knew nothing of the guilt which no human merit can expunge, 
nothing of the divine offer of an unmerited forgiveness, nothing of heavenly joy over penitent sinners. He was harsh, sour, self-righteous, and pitiless. While others made merry, he himself stayed away, and he sulked. In brief, he was a Pharisee. And of the Pharisees, Edelsheim could write, theirs was not a gospel to the lost. They had nothing to say to sinners. Christ's fraternization with outcasts was interpreted by the Pharisees as an inexcusable compromise with sin. They did not see it for what it really was, an expression of the divine, divine compassion towards sinners. Now, the challenge in this, and I'm going to wrap this up because... I got to pause right here. We're not done the clip yet. Alistair Begg is giving a sermon on the prodigal son, and he is just you know, just to use a pun, he's sodomizing this parable. Like, this is bad preaching on the parable. He's not, he's trying to allegorize it far beyond its actual meaning. I would say this is about people who are in the fold of God, who go astray, and that God's love does not let them stay astray. Because at the beginning of the story, both sons are in the father's household. They're both in the fold, so to speak. The son goes wayward. The son repents, and he comes back. This text is a repudiation of his advice to the grandmother to attend a gay wedding. It is a repudiation of that. Because the grandmother would be the father figure in this story. The grand... Oh, sorry, granddaughter. Uh, if I said grandson, if I'm misgendering. <laughs> um, if the granddaughter wants to, you know, marry a, a troon... That's them going wayward. That is them denying their inheritance. That is them basically apostatizing, well, not fully in, in the realm of the story, that they are going wayward. Does the father chase them into their waywardness? He waits for them to come back. He greets them when they do come back. And this parable is about the wayward person who's saved I would say a believer because they're starting out in the fold just like the lost sheep and the lost coin Jesus tells the same story three times in slightly different ways this is the most profound way that he tells this story is the prodigal son but it has the same exact meaning as the lost sheep and the lost coin that's why they all appear next to each other so he tell you know this is a, a trilogy so to speak in the in the Bible, and he's getting this wrong. As time goes, the challenge for me in this is I just assume, and I, I'm not going to assume it anymore. I assume that people are able to put two and two together and get four, no five or seven or nine or whatever it is. So for example, um, in the last days when this thing began. Um, my daughter said to me, Dad, you were way ahead of this game a long time ago when Alan DeGeneres came out and you preached those sermons on the gay debate. I mean, you've been so clear about this for all of your ministry. What is this about? I said, honey, I don't, I don't really know what it's about, but uh, yeah, that's right. And most recently, in dealing with Romans chapter 1. So I assume that anybody who picks this up goes, oh, well, wait a minute. Whatever, whatever he's on about there, there's no reason for alarm because after all, listen to what he said. And this is what I said in Romans 1, talking about this very issue. Quotes. So here's the challenge. How do you do this? In other words, how do you, how do you express the love of Jesus and, and do so in a way that doesn't just compromise everything? How do you honor God, obey his word, and treat your neighbors and your friends and your family members who have decided to go down this wrong path? Some people have decided the way to handle it is by admonition. So you just simply stand up and keep telling them, this is terrible, this is terrible, this is terrible. Some people have decided, well, we just won't say anything at all. Just let it go. Who cares? You know, it's a big world. People do different things. Neither is a possibility for a Bible-believing Christian. We are Not to true. treat with honor those who view us with hatred. Now understand that this... Admonition is the correct path. That is what Christians are called to do in this situation. Admonish. We're not following you down this path. We aren't supporting you down this path. This path leads to destruction. We cannot follow you down this path. You need to repent or perish should you go down this path. 
That's the biblical solution to this. That's the biblical response to this. But he just said it wasn't in the Christian's playbook. This grandchild was an enemy of the gospel, an enemy really in the family circle by dint of her lifestyle, an enemy. And Jesus says, you're supposed to love your enemies. Now, we can disagree over whether I gave that grandmother good advice or not. Not everybody on the pastoral team thinks I gave very good advice. And as I said, that's pretty interesting that he reveals that his own pastors disagree with him on that. Pretty interesting. You know, on another occasion with a different person in a different context, the advice may be very different. But at least let's acknowledge the fact that what we're doing is we're wrestling with biblical principle. And when principle for, let's say, holiness of life comes up against the principle of love for your enemy, how are you, how are you going to put that together? You got a problem with the grandmother showing up, sitting on the front row in a context that she absolutely despises, and sitting on her lap, nicely wrapped with beautiful paper and a bow around it, is her gift, the gift of a Bible. For a granddaughter, she knows, has no interest in the Bible. But because she believes that the entrance of God's Word brings light, she is prepared to trust the Holy Spirit to do the work. What happens to homosexual people, in my experience, quotes, is that they are either reviled or they are affirmed. The Christian has to say, we will not treat you in either of those ways. We cannot revile you, but we cannot affirm you. And the reason that we can't revile you is the same reason why we can't affirm you, because of the Bible, because of God's love, because of His grace, and because of His goodness. Maybe I'll just give you a couple of comments. So there, there's a lot of bad advice there. And his logic, he hasn't actually addressed the actual concerns. Like he's not addressing the people that are saying that this is a sin issue. He hasn't addressed that at all. He's just calling them Pharisees. And he's not defending this as not a sin. And he's trying to pit love, love your enemies against, you know, godliness and obedience. And it's just a false dichotomy. This is our last clip. I'm skipping the, you know, because what Alistair Begg is doing here, and he started to do it, and now he's going to continue to do it. I'm skipping the part where he reads what other people wrote about him, because there's, that's not beneficial. That's just him tooting his own horn. This is a man who's justifying his sin from the pulpit, and he he's reading some messages uh, you know, that are tooting his horn so he can toot his own horn in front of his own church. That is what Alistair Begg is doing here. So we're going to skip to the end where he kind of, again, toots his own horn, but at least it's his words and not other people's words. Send my love to you. And um, so hopefully uh, this whole thing will just, uh, the storm in the teacup will, eventually the teacup will fall over. There's only so many things you can, uh, I, I don't know how you can keep this going, actually. The, the reason that I haven't responded to any of the things in a personal way is because I, there's nothing that Cowardice. I can really add that I think would be, uh, that would make anybody believe me anymore. I think I can make it worse if I say more things, and it's bad enough as it is. And well, just one other thought, and I expect people to, how do they decide which bit they're going to troll through the social media, which bits they want to pick up? Where were they when, when, when I was speaking at the Christian college on the West Coast? And I had a lesbian walkout. So, again, as the outlet that broke the story, what happens on a college campus is very unremarkable to me and most Americans. I'm just being real. I don't care that, you know, uh, there was violence at a Ben Shapiro event on a campus. I really could not care less about that. So what happens on a college campus in the United States of America is an unremarkable event. It's very hard to convince me to care about what goes on on a college campus in the United States of America. Very difficult to care. The only time I remotely care about what goes on on a college campus in America is perhaps with uh, college football and college basketball. That's as close to I, that I get to caring about uh, you know, American universities. Although I do like what I'm hearing about the policies in Florida to get rid of the, you know, the DEI crap on college campuses. Now that... That can get me to care, but, you know, performative boycotts on a college campus, I don't care.
I cannot be bothered to report on that. So that that's just me answering Alistair Begg's objection as the person who ran the story that made this go viral. And they, they shut the whole thing down and walked out and the campus went into chaos for a week. You know why? Because I was explaining Ephesians chapter 5. And I made the most unbelievable mistake of saying the only place for sexual relationships is within a heterosexual, monogamous relationship between one man and one woman for life. Amen. And at that, they stood up and walked out. Well, why didn't somebody catch that one for me? <laughs> but you know what? I'm glad they didn't, and I'll tell you why. Because if I've got to go down on the side of one or the other, I'll go down on this side. I'll go down on the side of compassion with people actually accusing me of just weakness rather than go down on the site of condemnation, which closes any doors of opportunity for future engagement with those who know exactly what we believe about the Bible and about Jesus and about so on. So, uh, you know, I, I hope that this is helpful. I, I think as long as you understand that my response to one grandmother whom I have never met um, was not in any way a blanket recommendation to all Christians to attend LGBTQ weddings. There was nothing to do with that at all. If I was misguided in any way, it was I allowed my grandfatherly hat to uh, take over. It was my personal opinion, as I sensed what was best, as I learned about the individual and specific situation. That's as good as I can say. I hope that will be helpful to you. And it's a shame that his church applauded that. That was an awful sermon. He gave an awful uh, uh, defense of himself, and he wants to end by tooting his own horn about, you know, he angered and totally owned the libs on a college campus. Like, no, nah, I don't, I don't, that, that's just, it, it's cowardice and weakness. And, and that's nothing to commend. That's nothing to celebrate. And this is someone who's not willing to suffer for Christ. And it's a shame. It, it's a shame to see that he has such prominence in American evangelicalism, despite the fact that he apparently holds a, a bit of contempt for American evangelicalism. The way he, you know, believes that we don't understand nuance like the British do. And how how's the church in Britain nuancing right now? So, honestly. Alistair Begg is just someone to stay away from. He does not understand basic, easy issues. I just want to highlight that not attending a gay wedding is such an easy issue. It's easy. And before anyone in this comment section wants to go Reddit tier and say, what if it was your family member? I'd be saying the same thing. And I'm not that emotional of a person either, so don't act like it's going to be any different, you know, applied in the abstract versus in a real-life connection with me. It's not. So, those are my thoughts on that. This is disgraceful that Alistair Begg has let it come to this. But nonetheless, I, I'm with Andrew Torba when he says farewell, Alistair Begg. I'm with him on that. You may think that the reaction to Alistair Begg has been too harsh, but it has not been harsh enough. His response and justification to his initial comments, which were already bad as it is, have made the situation even worse. Even worse. And he doesn't have the scripture to back up his position and the passage he was preaching on is a repudiation of his own position. And he lacks the self-awareness to see that. If that's his level of exegesis on real life, I don't trust his exegesis on scripture. So that's where I'm at with Alistair Begg. He's canceled in my book. Uh, and not just on American Family Radio. So... That's where we're at. My name's Ray. This is the Evangelical Dark Web. If you like this video, do also subscribe to the channel. Let me know what you think about what I think, and we will catch you on the next one.